What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Hops Geek News, a podcast that talks about comic books, movies, TV shows, and of course, we feature beer of the week. Aside from that, if you're looking for other things from us, you can find us at the nerdinitiative.com, where I currently write comic book reviews weekly on the Nerd Initiative bullpen. A lot of great things that are coming out of there. So please go check out check out our reviews. We're uh, kind of trying to become build up the the comic book world, build the positivity within it as well. So check that out. I am Matt. With me is Lauren. You can find us Hops Geek News, any podcasting platform, any social media platform. That's where we are. I am on Twitter, acting a fool. Lauren handles things more on the Instagram side of things. And then we are both old and uh, figure out the TikTok <laughs> thing, right? So find us everywhere. We are there. And if you feel like supporting the show at all, patreon.com slash hopsgeeknews. Everything goes right into the show. We uh, we use it for making a better product. Going to Zoom comments. and stickers. <laughs> Zoom stickers. And then uh, actually, I'm going to be within a three-hour radius of three different Comic-Cons once I move to Virginia. So I will be at all three of those Comic-Cons. Lauren's going to get guilted maybe I'll be at coming to those. And uh, yeah, so come say hello. Support the show. We got a great guest today. Joss Trujillo is on with us today. He wrote a fantastic comic a few months ago, a six limited series, six issue limited series, Blue Beetle Graduation Day. And uh, we'll get into that in just a second. What I am drinking because of this show, because he also has a really good comic coming out that kind of wraps into it. And this is also from Los Angeles from 14 Cannons Brewery. It's called Wreck Your Ship. It's a triple IPA. <laughs> brewed with massive tropical aroma triple dry hopped with citra laurel and god bless you know me and names matuika hops it's 10.5 Ma- Matu- Mat- i usually know it you just messed me up glasses i'm blind <laughs> i am blind i can't hear you uh, i'm blind uh but yeah it's a there's a cannon if you happen to be in that right. area uh it's a limited 2023 release it's in west lake village in california it's not la proper but it's right outside near the agora hills area Check it out. Went there a few months ago or a month ago now for a wedding. There it is. Lauren, what you got? So my beer is actually not themed because I found a Calusa that I didn't know was in there. So this may be the first time ever I try to think of something. I mean, it's pretty and the artwork and the comic is pretty, so I can go with that. Uh, It's the Imperial Zote Double IPA from Calusa Brewing in Sarasota, Florida. I always usually drink tactical uh, tripping animals or Calusa. I was very excited to find this, but I do have it in a Wonder Woman glass. So at least I'm in with the DC comics. I don't have a Blue Beetle yeah. glass. I don't. You One know, day. Uh, Roosevelt's, if you happen to check out this, because I'm wearing, you know, I wear your shirts every time, do a Blue Beetle drop. I'm excited for that. You have the DC license. Do a Blue Beetle drop. Uh, my kids are wicked excited for the movie. That's all they've been talking about. And uh, I actually had the pleasure of running into meeting our guest back in. God, it was like February at this point at the Emerald City Comic Con. We were walking. My son loves Blue Beetle. Obviously, I do too. And uh, I stumbled upon his table, chatted with him. And then we bought the very first issue, which he was gracious enough to sign for my son. And then I tried to Apple Pay him, come back to the hotel. I got a rejection thing and I panicked because I was like, oh shit. Uh, it didn't go through and I freaked out message. Those him, cons like, never stuff. have good service. Well, I, I wanted to make sure I paid for this. So like me, I'm panicking, like having an anxiety attack, uh, but he was cool enough, paid him the next day. So I want to welcome our guest, Josh, welcome to the show. Introduce yourself. And uh, I know you have a beer, so go ahead and introduce that as well. Yeah. Uh, I'm Josh Trujillo. I'm a writer. I'm a comic book guy. I'm based in LA. Uh, I write for Blue Beetle right now for DC Comics. In the past, I've written for Captain America for Marvel, Hulkling and Wiccan, uh, Rick and Morty, uh, all sorts of different various things. And today I'm drinking, was it Brooklyn Brewery's Pulp Art? It's a hazy IPA. I love a hazy IPA. The hazier, the better. So it's a nice, yeah, it's a nice compliment to kind of this like awful heat we're going through right now in LA. God, it's it's so hot everywhere. Like, you just no escaping it it's hot everywhere the great climate wars have begun because well even our ocean is hot now because i'm in florida yeah Yeah, the keys got down to up to 100 degrees apparently it's terrible for the coral oh my god so i got that from my husband so don't quote me i didn't read the article myself but yeah it's the the waters are not doing great and that uh, yeah i could go into a whole thing on that even like with the sharks and some of the sharks with their egg sacs like they're born too soon because they're getting too much Mm -hmm. of the they need more nutrients and the heat. They're not uh, a lot of bad stuff, but we're here to talk about now good that Lauren stuff. Lauren brought us down. Yes. Let's talk about <laughs> the good sorry. stuff. It's shark week still here. Okay. 
Um, yeah. So we want to hear a bit about your origin story, too, because you don't just wake up and say, hey, I want to write comic books without falling in love with comic books first. So what is your geek origin story? How did you get into the whole world of comics? Yeah. So, um, you know, as long as I can remember, someone's been reading comic books to me or I've been reading them to myself. So, you know, that was my grandparents reading me the Sunday Funnies, Garfield, Blondie, Calvin and Hobbes was a big one, Snoopy, obviously. But like I would trace over the Garfield strips and rearrange them. And that's where I kind of I think I learned a little bit about kind of sequential art is like, oh, if panel two is now panel three, that changes the story. Right. And then you could come up with your own words and things. So I was from an early age, I was already playing around with kind of what I saw as like the nuts and bolts. But that's all I've ever wanted to do, Um, much to the detriment of any other possible avenue in my life. But, you know, I drew comics for myself throughout junior high and middle school and and high school and even in college a little bit. But like uh, I tried a couple of different things like journalism. It never really panned out. I ended up working in restaurants and Disneyland for over 10 years and worked in the service industry for too long. And uh, somehow I just never gave up. I took internships at comic book companies. I volunteered at booths. I went to every convention I could. And then eventually I started to save money and self-publish. And then from there, I was able to self-publish not enough to break even because you'll never break even in comics, but at least to get the attention of editors. And they saw, oh, he's a real person who makes real comic books. Maybe he'd be good for this two-page short, this four-page short. And so I've been doing comics uh, like that for probably like eight or nine years now. And so um, I'm very grateful that it and video games have kind of become my my full-time career. That's awesome. Now, we have to go back a, a second. Uh, we're, we literally, before this, recorded an episode about classic rides at Disney World and Disneyland. Oh. So yeah, what Disneyland. did you... Love, yeah, yeah. We love Disneyland. And well, I live in Orlando. And I, yeah, I had took my kids out to Disneyland for spring break. So what did you do when you worked at Disneyland? Yeah, so I worked there in a couple different capacities, but the big ones I did was I worked at the Winnie the Pooh ride and I worked on the Splash Mountain ride. I pushed buttons and I made magic and I told people to stay inside the vehicle and you do that every day, all day. Um, It's the best first job anyone could ever have, honestly, out of high school, like such a fun work environment and you get to meet 40,000 new people every single day and you have to deal with every kind of problem. And so you just like, you learn on your feet really quickly. But later I came back after I worked in restaurants and I was a restaurant manager and a bartender at this restaurant called Ariel's Grotto. So it was considered fine dining for children, which meant like goldfish crackers served on like a nice plate. (laughs) Yeah, the PPs and J's and silver and like uh, elevated rice aroni and things like that. Like the princess would, would come by your table every time. So between each course, you'd meet Cinderella or uh Rapunzel or whoever and so that was really stressful because the bottom floor is the fine dining element the top floor is a full service bar and you have to run both of them at the same time so you get really upset children on the bottom floor and you get really upset (laughs) drunk uh, adults on the top floor (laughs) it's hard to decipher who's worse right at that point like give me the upset children because at least you can sometimes reason with them Oh, I've seen some stuff at Epcot with some drunk Disney adults. Yeah, sometimes it gets a little. Oh, like Epcot weird. is Epcot is the 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 home for that, right? Is like because mm-hmm. you just drink around the world at all those different pavilions. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's my favorite park. Actually, food and wine started this morning. I was going to try to go, and the kids had zero interest in going to Epcot this morning. Oh, so but, jealous. Same. Uh, I love. Yeah, I love Epcot. Um, okay, so yeah, let's pull it back. So yeah, you've written comics for Marvel, DC, Dark Horse. Um, yeah, so you just told us about how you got into that, but what are some of your favorite comic book creators that have kind of inspired you or that you've just enjoyed over the years? Oh yeah. Um, let's see. I mean, a lot of like the Sunday morning gang where people I really look up to like Bill Watterson, I will always respect kind of how like anti-commercial he is with those characters, how he like refuses to kind of merchandise them like that. That didn't make sense to me as a kid who wanted like a Calvin and Hobbes plushie. Oh, but yeah. like as an adult who creates stuff, I'm like, this is like the most rock star thing you could possibly do. But um, beyond that, I really love like I loved Mark Way growing up. I loved um, even like, you know, Dark Knight Returns, Batman Year One. Everyone gets into those stories. Um, I was reading Ultimate Spider-Man as it came out. So like all 100 and however many issues that was. But, you know, I thought 
I love that, like that cadence of like a monthly or even more than monthly book because the book was selling so well, they were doing it like every three weeks or something. Um, but just kind of like real meat and potato superheroes. And then like later stuff like Alan Heinberg and um, on Young Avengers, or I liked Mark and Draco on Manhunter a lot. That was a big book for me, Gotham Central with Ed Brubaker. Um, that was huge. Uh, and honestly, just like, Oh gosh, Justice League International, the Giffen Di Matteo stuff, like all of it. The DC universe kind of opened up itself to me earlier than the Marvel universe. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I still have a lot of like Runaways was an incredibly huge book for me. And so like a lot of the younger Marvel characters are the ones I gravitated towards. Oh, which is interesting considering you just did Blue Beetle because obviously that's a young character as well. Um, so I, I love that you said that you, Kate, your, your origin story is the comic strips, because whenever we talk about our origin story, I always say, you know, I didn't get into comics until I was an adult because uh, I started I didn't start reading them until I was an adult. But as a child, I read Calvin and Hobbes and I read Farside and I read the, the Snoopy comics. So I never even thought that that could be an origin story. So that's really cool that you said that. Oh, yeah. Um, I love those books. Um, so I'm, I had the big, you know, the big fatty collections of every everything I checked out from the library over and over again. I used to love reading them like it would make me feel smart as a kid to get the Sunday funnies and, you know, mm -hmm. you read those comic strips. I'm like, yeah, I'll take that section of the newspaper at 10 years old. It's definitely like a lost art these days, too. Like you don't just I don't even know if it still happens. Like yeah, a, yeah it's, it's well, not to mention, like some of them just came out to be shitty people, too. So it's like a lost art of reading the Sunday funny. So everybody's comic. It's interesting to see the comic book origins that we had and where they're going to be in 10 years for kids like our, our kids age for example oh yeah like this is just it dates me but like web comics were not a major thing when i was growing yeah. up whereas like you know there's an everyone grew up with like homestar runner or you know um all sorts of other prominent web cartoons in comics yeah. like weren't cool when we were also getting into them either so now they're like these massive like you're not reading comics what's wrong with you and it's just i love that generational shift it's, it's mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> I used to never read comics in public. Now I'll whip them out on an airplane. I don't care anymore. Oh yeah. My backpack um, is full of comics on airplanes all the time. Yeah. That's a good, pl it's a great way to catch up because my stack's getting bigger because I've been reading the Thrawn books and my comic stack is huge right now. So you've written many different characters. You just listed a few of them beforehand. Are there some characters you enjoy writing more or some characters that are easier to write? Yeah. Um, you know, they all present their challenges. You know, you write a character that you love really deeply, like um, like Scarlet Witch, for example, and she has a big fandom. So you have those expectations kind of waiting for you. Um, and so you kind of have to work kind of to, to align with what you think the audience is looking for sometimes while still telling the story you want to tell. But the characters that come easier to me right now are kind of these younger voiced characters. I co-created a character called Aaron Fisher, with Christopher Cantwell and Jan Bazaldua. He's the gay Captain America, the Captain America of the railways. And I just did a six part arc for him on Marvel Unlimited. And I'm really happy with how that one turned out. But Blue Beetle, Jaime Reyes is like, is my guy. I find his voice really easy to latch onto probably because we were very similar when we were that age. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, I'd say right now it's the younger class. And then also it's always fun to write the cosmic characters that are older than the concept of aging. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I am, I am eternity and stuff. Like it's, it's, it's a good balance. I feel like there's That's definitely awesome. a lot of like wiggle room. Um, for example, we're going to get in a blue beetle in a second, but there's a lot of like, we can all kind of put ourselves in the shoes of Jaime, for example, because he's a, a teenager and in graduation day, it's all about, Hey, what are you doing? It's like your friends are going to college and, choosing your own path of sorts, which for a lot we of all us, face we could put little, our yeah. shoes in. And so it was very easy to relate to it. I know for me, I, cause I went through this, I didn't go to college until I was like 24 or something like that. And so I could very easily relate to something that and to a degree, of course. Um, but yeah. And then of course the, the older characters, I always love reading the older characters. Cause how do you write somebody who's older than the, the universe themselves, so to speak? Mm -hmm. That was a very dry humor. It seems like like it just it's like the pop culture references go over their head. But yeah, teenagers are hard to write, and you can see that when you watch certain things because they're either 
you know, treating the teenager like they're way older than they are and treating them like an adult when they're not an adult, they're still developing their brain and learning things and they still need guidance. And then there's other times where the teenagers are treated like infants and have no choice and are always, you know, seated at the kids table. So it's hard to find that balance. And so, yeah, let's move into Blue Beetle graduation day because I felt like you nailed that balance. I felt oh, like a doubt. We and I got, you know, you get a little bit of almost like that Spider-Man vibe of, you know, he's struggling school and and work and he's always late to everything. And I'm a little more Marvel. So that's what I always do with DC. I'm Mm -hmm. always like, it's like this Marvel character. Yeah. So we we like to keep balance on this podcast. Um, He thinks Batman versus Superman was a great movie. I don't. So we have balance. (laughs) Old shit again. That will never die. Um, Much like Martha. Because someone will always save her. Um, so, yeah, let's go into this. So uh, while the original Blue Beetle is obviously been around forever in the comic book world, as far as pop culture, I personally only knew the newer version in from Smallville. That's my only introduction until I actually read your comic book was that. And I Wait, think he was only in Blue one Beatles episode. Yes. And I, I didn't even really realize until I Googled it. And I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that episode. Mine was... Uh, but oh, I watched Smallville a year ago for the Titans, first time. Or Ju- Young Justice, I should say. That's where I really got a- acquainted with him from the animated cartoon Young Justice. But in general, he is a newer character in pop culture. So with him being newer to a majority of the population, what are you hoping anybody who's read Blue Beetle Graduation Day takes away about this specific character? Yeah. So, uh, you know, Jaime Reyes, he is... He's a Mexican-American teenager. He grew up in El Paso, Texas um, with his loving family who are way too involved in his life. And, uh, you know, a mystical sci-fi alien scarab beetle falls from the sky and lands on his back, basically. And now he's a superhero. Um, So, you know, he's not the first Blue Beetle. There's there's at least two others that we know about, Dan Garrett and Ted Kord, who's a big fan favorite and a favorite of mine, too. Um, but you know, he's a regular kid who's dealing with these extra worldly problems and he's trying to navigate the DC universe in a way that I think is really relatable. Um, you know, there's a lot of like, there could be a lot of grim and gritty when you get up to the higher echelons of power, but Jaime has like the most powerful artifact in the DC universe attached to his spine and he's still a happy go lucky kid. And so when he enters a situation, he brings a lot of, I think, levity and life into it that maybe it wasn't there before. And I love like the original run with John Rogers um, and Keith Giffen and Coley Hamner, Raphael Bukerke, uh, these throwing him against the oddball corners of the DC universe, whether it be Lobo or Phantom Stranger next issue or whoever, uh, there was always a new threat for him. And there was always something for me, the reader, to learn about the DC universe as I was reading the book. Because I think a lot of people who are reading Blue Beetle back then, maybe people who are reading Graduation Day and the new series now, This might be their only DC book. So this is their window to seeing how cool the DC universe is. And Jaime is like our, like our journeyman through that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You, you absolutely do a a wonderful job. Basically you, you give that window into the DC universe. You bring all the other justice league characters in, but at the core of the story, a lot, it's very easy when you start playing with other characters to forget what it's about, but the way you guys and your team kept it grounded was hey no at the, at the end of the day this is very much a high blue story. beetle comic this is a yeah. blue beetle story and it really fleshes itself out through those six issues which again it's it's not easy to do and so hats off to you and the team for basically keeping that heart in the middle of the story oh yeah yeah this was, this was a big like imperative of our editor andrew marino who's like really been with us from the very beginning as you may have known we started working on a blue beetle pitch years ago And kind of just through a happy coincidence of events, we were able to get graduation day going. But, um, you know, heart and family have always been at the center of those books. And it was really important for us not to lose Jaime and kind of the sea of superheroes we're going to throw at him, but also to kind of like center the book still around family, even though even though he's away from his his the family he grew up with, he still has a family here in Palmyra City, the new city that he's inhabiting. Mm-hmm. So how did you get set up on this? Was this a story that you pitched to DC or were they kind of like playing with the idea of Blue Beetle? How did you guys end up coming up with this storyline, for instance? Yeah, so uh, let's see, years ago, I want to say like five years ago, which just shows how long these things can take sometimes. But uh, 
But there was interest from DC to do some Blue Beetle with me, but we didn't know what shape that would be. It's like, maybe we'll do a one shot or maybe we'll do like a tie-in to some event or something. And so because of like editors changing over and uh, cosmic events happening and whatever, it kind of just kept getting pushed to the side. And then um, DC Comics had a competition called Round Robin where they had different creative teams kind of vie for the opportunity to do a complete miniseries. So the fans would vote on which creative team they wanted to win, what team they sound, what book sounded more appealing to them, and the winner would get a full miniseries. Um, spoiler alert, we did not win. Uh, we lost mm-hmm. to a book by Tim Seeley called Robins, uh, which you should go check out. But our fans did not let DC forget about us. And every time, every time there would be a new, you know, here are the new books for the month, people would be like, where's Blue Beetle? Where's Graduation Day? Um, but as for the story itself, like, we knew we wanted to take Jaime to kind of the next chapter of his life. Um, I think there are still a lot of great stories to be told with like high school superheroes, but for Jaime, I felt like it was ready to give him some energy behind him, give him a little bit of momentum. And the story that appealed to me was like, I think the natural path for a lot of teenage characters in fiction is like, they go straight to college, right? Mm -hmm. Like they, they, there's no alternative for them, but I knowing the people that I know in my life, knowing my own experience, that wasn't a surefire thing at all. And there were a lot of doubts. People, a lot of people go straight into the working world. A lot of people go into other technical schools. They don't necessarily go to university. And that's not to say that Jaime won't ever go to school. It's just that right now he has a lot on his plate. If you're saving the world every week, you don't necessarily study for your AP exams, you know? Right. And so I wanted to give him that kind of element of like, you have all this potential but what are you going to do with it? You have to make up your mind, Jaime. You have to pick a lane. And he's still kind of figuring that out in our story. Yeah. And, and I honestly feel like every 18 year old does. It's like, even if you know you're going to college, you still aren't certain what you want to do. Like I last minute decided to go to community college for my freshman year. Cause I didn't want to leave home. I wasn't ready. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, s- s- the, the kids are still kids. Your brain's still developing until you're 25. You're so it's to make these like life altering decisions at the age right. of 17, 18. The idea and, of picking your major at 18 is insane. I, yeah, absolutely. I, I originally was going to be a history teacher and I didn't decide until I was 28 to switch into marketing, for example. So it's like we force people and we put so much pressure on these kids to just, Hey, it's time to grow up already. Okay. As soon as you graduate high school, you better have a job. You better be doing and Just this. keep taking out those loans. You'll be yeah, fine. Take out all those student loans. You're never going to be able to pay back, for example. And it's just insane. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of like, I think we've, we're turning a corner, right? It's like pe- young people should have a lot of options available to them. They should have a lot of play- like options. Just like, what do you want to do with your life? Have the time to figure it out. Because yeah, yeah. so many of us just feel like we're pushed into a corner. And Jaime feels like he's pushed into a corner to have to be a superhero and to be this like upstanding model teenager. In, yeah. Even while and being you, forced into being a superhero at the same time, you do a wonderful job showcasing that the justice league, AKA Batman still treats him like a child. And so one of my favorite personal uh, sequences from the story was when Jaime and even Superman were basically like, no, we need to trust him like Batman F off, for example, trust him show showcase let him follow his lead for once and i think just the way that blended together was it It was well done yeah very well done because you you expect those certain tropes no matter whether you're reading a comic or watching a tv show or watching a movie there are certain tropes that you tend to expect that's coming and when that doesn't happen it's always very refreshing yes. and i think that's you know what people love about you know certain things like deadpool or anything that's like or black mirror, you know, all those things where you're like, I know how this is going to end. And then it doesn't end like that. And that's always so refreshing to see. And obviously I don't want to ruin too much of it, but I think one of you were saying, I went to my comic book shop and blue beetle graduation day was gone. I had yeah, to get the same. virtual my ones from Amazon. So yeah. Cause that's always where I want to buy all my comics. I like having in my hand and I like supporting the comic book shop, but yeah, it was sold out. So it's doing great. Except Matt has that beautiful little signed copy there. Yes. I have the signed copy of issue one. I was lucky enough to pick out the, you again, this is, this is the issue from the infamous, you know, me and my hotel room after my son decided after five minutes, mm-hmm. he didn't want to walk anymore. Cause every seven year old just <laughs> focuses on food and everything else, but enjoying themselves. But yes. Yeah. 
So um, I'm going to pull back a lot of our notes we've already actually talked about. So I did notice in one of Jaime's shirts actually says Sholo. Is that a nod to the actor who's going to be playing him? Yeah, uh, it's a big nod from our artist, Adrian Gutierrez, my Blue Beetle brother. Um, he's been a delight to work with. And it's so, this is the longest, well, we'll talk about the other project, the Washington Gay General, where I've, I worked with the artist a lot. But I wake up to new pages every single day from uh, Adrian and our colorist, Will Quintana, and our incredible letterer, Lucas Catoni. But uh, every so often, Adrian will put in these Easter eggs. And I was like, I, did I tell him to put that in? So what will happen is like, I'll create like a Google folder of like, here's some cool looks that Jaime could wear when he's like not in superhero mode. And so he'll see that and be like, he'll just add his little details. And so I, it's funny, we just got this kind of, I guess I can share this. We He and I just got messaged by Zolo himself uh, on on social media and just to let us know that how much he was looking forward to the new series and how much he's looking forward to the new villain we're introducing. And, and that everyone's a big fan of what we do, which meant like, you, you know, like what? Like, that's like crazy. So, uh, that's awesome. you know, you just write Zolo and he comes and lets you know, you like, <laughs> well, and that makes so you probably, cool. yeah. And it probably makes you feel better about the character who's bringing this character to life. If he's that invested in the comic, you know, that, he's got heart in the character already because those are I feel like the the people you know you look at like someone like you know Ashley Eckstein who is so <laughs> obsessed with being Ahsoka she is in, in case that character and she does that character justice with everything she does because she loves it so much so it's nice to see that he's embracing the origin of the character and loves the character so much already well, so that was he, a fun little nod well, not for nothing he also is kind of the first character something beautiful about Blue Beetle He's kicking off the new DCU as well. Like he, this is the first movie that takes place in that new universe um, that they've all established at this point. So it's very cool that. And we all fell in love with like him this, at Cobra Kai. Yes. Oh, he was so good in Cobra Kai. I'm sure we all saw him in that, the Blue Beetle fans. And we're like, you know, he'd be a, a great Jaime. And then he got cast and was like, oh, well, this is a, this is like a no brainer. Here we go. Yeah. Absolutely. I know Lauren yeah. and I were talking about it. Like, why isn't he cast as some sort of superhero at this point? And then, of course, when the casting came out, we're like, duh, this makes perfect sense. And you can just tell from, the, I mean, the trailers alone, they're having a ton yeah. of fun in that movie. And they're doing so much fighting that they've learned in Cobra Kai, for sure. Yeah, anytime <laughs> I fall in love with an actor in anything, I'm like, why aren't they in Marvel, Star Wars, or DC? Like, <laughs> they deserve more. I need to see them in these other things that I love. Um, So you mentioned working with the artist. So you know, we m most of our guests who are comic book creators are Kickstarter comic book creators. So there's a lot of back and forth and having to research with the artist. So having worked for Marvel and especially DC in this particular project, how was that process with the artist? Do you get to pick the artist? Is the artist assigned to you? And is there a lot of back and forth or is your idea pretty quickly put onto the page? Yeah. So, um, you know, Adrian and I were kind of like, uh, were paired off by our editor, Andrew, and it worked out, honestly, from the beginning, you know, we both wanted to do, all three of us rather, wanted to do a really youthful book that like drew from elements of like Sentai, drew from elements of like Japanese manga and drew from elements of like high, like high octane superhero storytelling. And so Adrian's style is very like youthful and energetic and has a lot of momentum to it. Uh, and so like that lined up really well with the kind of story I wanted to tell. You know, I'm happy to have a scene of two characters just sitting there around the table, but uh, we will never get that from Adrian. He will always find the most interesting angles or the way to find the excitement in the scene. And I just, it, may, it really elevates the story I'm trying to tell so much, you know, as I just try to get out of his way sometimes and also mm -hmm. give him the hardest job in the world where um, it's an issue five of graduation day. It has 22 different characters in it. And I, I had to write this like apology email to, to, to Adrian before I got the script. I was like, just so you know, this has a lot of characters and you, they don't have to be in every panel. And I'm so sorry. But that was just the way the story was unfolding. And every so often I'll throw him a curveball like that. And he always rises to the occasion. That's so whose idea was it to have the characters with their logos when they first showed up? That was I kind of that. me. That's and my that was, that's my nerdy thing. So cool. That we have awesome. the, we have the best letterer in comics, um, Lucas Gatoni. So he letters the book, 
in English as well as in Spanish because the book is available in Spanish. You can get graduation yes. day collections and the new number one in Spanish as well. Um, but my my the rule I try to do is whenever we're introducing a character that would have that has a logo or would should have a logo, we do that. So whether it be like someone like Batman or someone like more obscure like Black Condor or even Victoria Cord, Lucas threw together a quick logo for her that I'm like, I want this on a t-shirt actually. <laughs> I uh, I can fully agree because every time there's a new like logo with a name, I'm like, oh wow, this is like a simple black t-shirt with the logo and name on it. I'm sold because I'm a simple. Well, that's t-shirt. how you know they're important, right? You're like, mm-hmm. oh, yes, this character got a logo. Okay, <laughs> it's like because it stands yeah. out from the typical writing and. It's the the amount of characters in issue five because that's when you really introduce the Justice League and there's so much happening. Is it the reach? You know, all sorts of things going on. And you guys, it was like poetry, just reading it between the art and sometimes saying things without actually saying things. And uh, you can tell straight from the get-go, as you said, that the pairing was a, a hit from the start. If folks haven't read this, it it's literal poetry on a page if if you want to read it which i highly recommend please get the physical copy because there's nothing really like the physical copy such a fantastic job yeah and it's always fun to get to know the characters before the movie comes out because i know i mean that's to me how i got into comics i wanted to know more about the origin of these characters and sometimes i feel like reading them on the page you get more of an idea of who they are okay. um so you, you know, you, obviously this is a DC comic and you've worked for Marvel and Dark, Ho- Dark Horse. As far as the art process, was it similar with those other comic book labels or is it pretty, a little bit different with each one? Um, it's pretty similar. I would say that like uh, with with the Blue Beetle book, because we, we've we worked together on so many, you know, we've done over, we're working on issue three right now. So what's we've done almost 200 pages of Blue Beetle comics together now, which is incredible to think about for me. But like, we have a great back and forth. Like I wake up to pages, I give my notes, he has revisions done by the end of the day and we move on to the next page. Whereas like sometimes for like, um, I did these Hulk thing and Wiccan comics from Marvel Unlimited, which are the unlimited comics are kind of their own thing. But um, I worked with, the last one was Takeda Koro, this incredibly t- talented mangaka. And, um, I would kind of just send my scripts out and I wouldn't see the return pages until basically the entire chapter was done. Um, And so that was a different approach, right? Instead of being kind of like panel by panel, page by page, it's just like, here's the storytelling. And they do that for a reason. It's because the way these unlimited comics read on Marvel, it's a scrolling app. It's a scroll. It's not like you're turning a page. It's like one long image you're looking at on your phone. And so your eye follows downward. And so it only the, the only way it makes sense to read is by doing the entire thing at once almost. So that's kind of a little in the weeds, but <laughs> that's how the sausage gets made. I love those guys. <laughs> I love seeing the behind the scenes things. Me, I'm, yes, I'm kind of a nerd we're big on the fun stuff. facts and stuff. And so obviously you have a upcoming series in September. Um, it launches out of the final issue of Graduation Day. We can't spoil anything. We can talk about it. But what can you tell us? What can you get people hyped up about this upcoming series that you guys have coming out? Yeah. So uh, Jaime Reyes is back. He's in Palmera City, his new home with his new Beatles. We've got our yellow beetle, Dynastus. We've got our green beetle, Natita. Uh, we've got Starfire. We've got Ted Cord. We've got Victoria Cord. What is she up to? Uh, and She's we have a whole new thieves, cast. Or buying from thieves, obviously. She's up to something. Uh, so, yeah, I still uh, don't trust her. I would not. I would not do that. Um, and so, she, you know, uh, she, we've got a whole cast of characters. Jaime has a whole team, basically, of superheroes behind him now. And they're all looking to him for answers. So he has to figure out how to step up and really be the leader. The problem is that uh, there, there's a new foe, or maybe I should say an old foe, from kind of the origins of the Blue Beetle mythos who's coming back and going to strike at Jaime where it hurts the most. So this is our upcoming Scarab War storyline. And there's going to be a, there's, there's going to be some, some fighting happening. It's going to be some drama, going to be some big superhero action. Blue Beetle Jaime Reyes is the uh, Dom Toretto of the DC universe. Just, just throwing it out there. So no, he absolutely is. I, I think about that. I have a Dominic Toretto um, Lego figure. Oh my God. I have it too. His Dodge Charger. I have the little one. I do too. Makes me, I want to set up a little lighting package, you know, 
yeah. or sound effect or something. You just, you just get it, man. I just yeah. want you to know, you just get it because I am obsessed with that franchise as well, and so I have that exact same Lego set. It, uh, you just, you just, you just understand. He gets it, folks. I love it. And oh, as soon as he he jumped in, yeah, I knew. Look, I can't go an episode without talking about Fast and Furious. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's just how I'm, I'm wired <laughs> at this point. And so I want, before we, we shift gears for just a second and wrap up, what is something that you hope that folks get out of your story of blue beetle? And what is, what are you hoping that they kind of just pull? If there's only one thing, maybe two things that they take from the entire run that you guys are doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, the big thing for me with Jaime is he leads with his heart. He leads with his empathy. And despite, or maybe because he has so much power, he has this real care and compassion for everyone around him. And he feels this weight of, you know, that kind of responsibility to care for the people in your life too. And so I hope that people see that, that Jaime is as much as we kind of beat him down a little bit, because you got to kick the hero around a little bit in their own book. Oh, yeah. You know, Jaime is in the big leagues. He is, he's, he's Superman in my mind. And I just hope the world wakes up to it. He honestly, the scarab is, they were, they even allude to it in this story run. It's a world ender if it could be, but he's learned how to mm -hmm. control it, which takes a lot of power as you kind of mm -hmm. discover. And you're, you're hundred percent right. He is a heavy hitter. I hope people take that his power sets seriously, because yeah. again, it's, a very powerful, he's a very powerful being, and he could honestly go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody in the Justice League, in my opinion. Yeah, and sometimes he's a little, um, I think people think of him as being uh, uh, on the outskirts of the DC universe, and I don't think that's true, especially you'll see in Scarab War. We're, we're tying back to stories that came out 60, 70 years ago. Um, not that I expect you to dig out your old Charlton comics from the 1950s, <laughs> but if you did, you would see that I did my homework, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, I should yes, but you know, there's all this legacy. It's a big theme within the Blue Beetle books. It always has been, and and just trying to kind of tie it all together so that classic readers who've been reading since Ted Cord was the hero in the '70s and '60s and '70s and '80s, all the way to today, who've never read a Blue Beetle comic at all, I hope they mm -hmm. they can tap into this world and see its rich mythos as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, a hundred percent. And now. Before we go ahead and uh, wrap up, there is, by the time this comes out, you have a graphic novel coming out this week that I have read. I don't want to give anything away, but I do want to dive into a little bit real quick. It's called Washington's Gay General, The Legends and Loves of Baron Von Steuben. What can you tell us without giving away? Because I know we talked about how the pre-orders have already gotten it at this point. So people have read it. The word is probably, but out. I haven't read it. So I don't no one hasn't read it yet. I have. And uh, you already heard me gush pre-show. What can you tell the general audience about this story? Yeah. So for the Lawrence in the audience, uh, <laughs> uh, so this is a nonfiction graphic novel. This is all true. Some of it's a little bit larger than life, but that's just the way the guy lived. Um, George Washington had a general that served under him in the revolutionary war. He was flamboyant. He dressed in outlandish clothing. He was obsessed with his status and his ego. He was in a thruple. He liked to date his younger cadets and he liked to have underwear parties or sometimes no underwear parties. Yeah. yeah. And like he was that. also maybe the most important military leader we've ever had in the United States. So we learned so much about um, how to run an army, how to how to discipline soldiers, how to for how to turn these kind of farmers and uh, if you know illiterate farmers basically into a fighting force that can take on the British who at the time were the most powerful fighting force in the world this is all because of the contributions of this guy Baron von Steuben he came to America late in his life he fought in Prussian wars up to that point and he had this established career but it's really about uh, this great military leader who happened to be what we would now call a gay guy what does it mean to call someone who lived so long ago gay when that term didn't exist then? What is it? What are the struggles and what are the, the opportunities that face someone in that position back then? And also just like we unearthed kind of the fascinating story of how his life kind of weaves through these major wars. And we meet a lot of other figures from that era, whether it be uh, the, the, the assistants, his secretary that works for him, or whether it be uh, Frederick the Great, one of the greatest military leaders of all time, 
we learn kind of about this queer side of history that we've never explored before or it's rarely been explored before. Yeah. That's awesome. Cause one of my questions was how much of it is it, like, did you take any liberties and, you know, make some of it fiction, but you just said it's all nonfiction. So that's, it's all really nonfiction cool. to the, to the best of my ability. But I will say that the, the, I pull from the first biography of his that I could find, which was like 1830. And that was really helpful because it had a lot of like letters from him and stuff. But, um, the downside was it was really like it glorified him in the way that all biographies of revolutionary war generals glorify the subject matter. And mm -hmm. so trying to read between the lines, it doesn't hide the fact that he shared a great love with Benjamin Walker, for example, one of his uh, subordinates, but it doesn't necessarily call it a queer love or a gay love. And there's also, you just get, there's a lot of reading between the lines where, uh, you know, a, a regular, a, a straight reader probably wouldn't think twice mm -hmm. about like, oh yeah, he, he just shared a house with all these young cadets and that's just right. what they did together. And it's like, well, hmm, hold like, on, just hold on, Mary. House. We're cool guys. Well, it's like, yeah. How many people in history? Oh, that woman just, you know, she died an old spinster living with her best friend and did so much of that. And there are, cause again, like I mentioned before we started recording, my daughter is a history major and she will tell me, she's like, oh yeah, they wanted to say they were roommates and this and that. And she, said that there's certain historians that are now pulling some of that information and showing, no, this is what was happening. And that is what is happening. And we just, historians in the past have spun it to how they wanted to spin it or how they saw it that wasn't accurate. So it's really cool that we're, you're, you pulled this real information and are, are laying it out. I'm really excited to read this book. I'm very excited. Yeah. Thank you. You know, we did, uh, me and my illustrator, Levi Hastings, my co-author, um, we really put our heart into it and it's, I've never written uh, a nonfiction graphic novel before. He's certainly never drawn one. Um, so we really did the best we we could to try to get all the facts right. And what we kept coming up against was that uh, in portraying these, these figures, even as they were writing letters to each other at the time, they were all lying to each other and building up their, they were writing towards history as well. You know, they were trying to create their own myth in a way that you see presidents today and stuff kind of do. And so we're trying to pull apart that and figure out who the real people were. And that's been a really interesting challenge because Levi's from Idaho. I'm from Southern California. And we tried to write this thing in the, while the world was shut down. Mm. And I, I do love that specific aspect where you kind of, one thing that's beautiful about this is you interweave your personal stories in with these historical figures. And it's like, guys, there's so much going on in the world right now, but when you break it down, like we're just human beings trying to live our lives. And that's what Von Steuben was at the end of the day is like, he had things that he loved and his story is kind of a tragic one as, as you kind of read throughout, I'm not going to spoil it because again, Lauren, you're uncultured, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a very tragic story in the end. And you read about a lot of these guys who they had to take on wives, for example, because we didn't have terminology for X, Y, and Z back in the day. Although really we could have just lived and just been who you are. And at the end of the day, I took the story as ex accept yourself for who you are. And it's a little easier said than done, obviously, but Levi did beautiful work mixing in the blues, the whites, the blacks with the, the artwork and just the, the writing alone, how you interwove your personal stories with other historical figures. It's it's a work of art. And I said this before the show, and I'm going to say it now. It's one of the more beautifully well-written graphic novels, comic books, whatever you want to call it, that I have actually read in the last few years. Oh, I, I, that means a lot. And I'm sure it will mean a lot to Levi when I text him immediately after this. But, <laughs> um, you know, it was uh, it was a real treat to work on this. And this is such an interesting story to kind of get to tell in some ways for the first time. Um, but like, you know, we only know so much about Baron von Steuben because of his secretaries, because he, he because he was of a certain status and class. And for every von Steuben, there's maybe there could be a million other lives that are completely undocumented. Like I was saying, a lot of the Revolutionary War soldiers, they didn't they weren't necessarily literate, all of them. They didn't necessarily, we don't know a lot about their personal lives. We don't know about their home lives. They could have been in queer relationships. We don't know. 
Um, and so there's so much that's, that's intentionally left out of history and so much that is unintentionally left out of history or erased or destroyed or forgotten. And so I hope this book, at least in some way, lifts up his von Steuben uh, reputation, but also uplifts all these other queer figures from the revolutionary era. I hope a lot of historians now will maybe re-look at some of their own collections and see, oh wait, maybe this this couple of uh, seamstresses that lived together until they were elderly, maybe there was something else going on there. Yeah. They weren't just best friends well, that couldn't find husbands. To a, to a recent point, I mean, in the military, there was don't ask, don't tell for the longest time. And it's just like, why? Who who cares? And I find myself saying this every day. It's like, who fucking cares? Well, Clinton wanted to make it okay. And then he got backlash. So that was his compromise. And I, yeah, that was, yeah, it's, that's it's what so that was funny about, to me yeah. that in, again, I, I did compromise in show, quotes for anybody just listening. Mm-hmm. Yes. Bef- something I said before the show is being in this culture. It just, it's funny to me that at the end of the day, it's like, guys, do you know, our doctrine is based off of this. And I have to laugh because it's just, these people are just so ignorant and it's just like, who cares? Who cares? Let yeah. them be human. Well, and I, my last question is how did you end up finding him? Like, how did you find Von Steuben? Was this something you like, per- like sought out or was it a story that was brought to you? How did this come about to bring you into digging into his life? Yeah, uh, you know, I I wish I could say I was on like a spirit hike and I saw him at the top of some hill. But, you know, Levi Hastings and I had wanted to work together for a long time. We did um, a a mini comic that was a, a Revolutionary War gay romance and it got a little bit of traction. And so we would take that to conventions around the country. And when we went to these conventions, people would approach us and say, oh my God, you need to do a comic about Von Steuben. And we're like, that sounds great. Who's Von Steuben? And so from there, we started to read books. We started to look online and watch videos. And we're like, oh, there's a lot of meat here, but we'd never done a graphic novel before. And so we did a mini comic for this website called thenib.com. And they do a lot of important nonfiction comics and editorial cartoons. And our, our little, I don't know, 25 panel comic about Von Steuben's life blew up. It was like, I don't know what, what is a good number of viewers for a web comic, but we broke it. And the Winib was like, oh, you became our most viewed comic like overnight. And like, we were a huge hit for them. And from that, we were able to get a publisher interested, Abrams Comic Arts, and now they're surely in print, approached us to want to do a full version of that as the book. And so it's one thing to kind of glean a couple different books and a Wikipedia page and sources to do a short comic, but it's another thing to try to find enough material to do like 190 pages or wherever we landed with it. And that was, that was incredibly difficult, I will say. And it's a lot of reading incredibly dry, dry military history books. (laughs) (laughs) It's, it it can be very dry and, but to a history nerd like me, I mean, it, it came out perfectly well. Yeah, I'm a fan of history. Um, you know, the the one I was trying to write towards was, I don't know if you've read um, Sarah Vowell's books, but like the Partly Cla- Cloudy Patriot or Assassination Vacation, that was kind of the tone I was looking towards. Uh, and like something that a casual reader could pick up and enjoy. But also if you have an appreciation from history, hopefully you can connect this to other stories you know, other people you know. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. In- Again, at, at the end of the day, you find yourself during this story, find there's emotional beats. And at the end, I was like, dang, I, there was so much in there that I didn't know. And anytime that you get emotional reactions out of art, out of writing, whatever it is, it's it's a hit in my book. And that's exactly what this comic book is, I can say, at the end of the day. Lauren, I know you got well, something. And I'm sure there's an extra level to it, too, because, you know, it's it's nonfiction. And for me, anytime I'm reading or watching anything that's nonfiction and something, you know, tragic or emo- anything emotional happens, it hits different because that's the thing. A lot of times when we learn history, like sometimes we have to detach ourselves from it so that we can hear it and handle it. But like, we forget that these were real people who were living the same as we're living today. It's just like, Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Oh, this just happened. Da, 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 da. It's like, no, imagine if that happened to you today. So I'm, ex- I'm very excited to read this. Yeah. I, I, I'm really excited for you to check it out. I hope everyone checks it out obviously, but um, you know, it's a real, it's a real human story about someone who wanted more for themselves from a very early age. And 
lied the entire way up and down the ladder to get there, but also had this incredible gift as well that we see over and over again. They prove themselves that they're worth it, but how they how they get to those positions is always a little shady. Yes. <laughs> and some things never change. Congress doesn't want to pay their people and uh, can currently relate to that as a. Uh, oh my God. I want, I, the book I want to do next is like about Congress just not paying people. Oh my God. Like, I will <laughs> gladly tell you firsthand accounts from how many times currently I'm like the move I'm supposed to do. Congress, they, they, there's a whole thing I'll talk offline about. Yeah. That was just. Oh God! If you well, in like World War, post World War One, right? It was like the bank bank revolt or whatever, and oh, the bonus yeah. revolt. Yeah, uh, where all those soldiers were like, "You promised us a bonus for fighting in the war," and Congress is like, "Well, mm, I don't know about that." Did and I so they just, it? and then these soldiers just occupied the National Mall. Like they're just like, "Okay, we're not leaving." Meanwhile, we have congressmen who should have been out long times ago, stroking out on TV. But uh, politics isn't a part of the comic books, movies, TV shows that we promised you guys. That's I want to say as, as a final, final, final thought, let the, the people who might not know who you are know where they can find your work and uh, all your upcoming exciting projects that you have going on. Yeah, um, you can find me online uh, on whatever social media platform is left as of this airing. It's, but, it's changing um, every day. <laughs> Changing every day. Um, you can find me at Lost His Keys Man. I lost my keys, man. Where you can just look up my name, uh, Josh Trujillo, T R U J I L L O. Blue Beetle number one launches in September. Washington State General launches on August 15th. You can find me at FlameCon, uh, the 12th and the 13th of August in Times Square, New York City, where we'll be debuting the book. And um, just follow me online for. Uh, Shit posting, honestly. And relate. <laughs> I was like, I that's Matt with our with our house geek account. That is me on the on I don't know. Do we call it Twitter? Do we call it X? Who knows? Uh X gonna give it to you and I'm gonna give you shit posts. That's what I'm giving to you. Um I feel a little freed to write worse tw tweet. I'm gonna keep calling them tweets because I'm they're, they're I mean, tweets I till I die at this point. Yeah, I'm I, look, I'm just gonna tweet harder. And last night I watched Godzilla versus Mothra. And I just live tweeted it like it was 10 years ago. Awesome. You remember when we, were all doing, when we were doing that all the time? We're just like, this is what I'm watching tonight. And like, no one does that anymore. And I'm like, well, no. the platform, I'm going to get all my jollies in now before it's too late. Right. I did that with Walking Dead back in 2010. And then I took <laughs> like a, a 10 year hiatus from Twitter until Matt created a Hobbs Geek News account. And I'm like, this isn't what we're doing anymore. No, I'm not live with Talking can. Dead, hoping they retweet the my shit. I mean, it's a lot of people just hop on Twitter now, just like dunk or shit or whatever it is on people. Me, I'm on there. I'm either live tweeting or I'm just being. Stupid. You, he does an amazing job handling the Twitter. I get like overwhelmed. Like I don't know how. Like I can handle the Instagram. I cannot handle the Twitter. He's responding I, to things, I've got sharing 17 things. Seventeen different social media accounts, and we get it's impressive. Zero. So, folks, keep that in mind. Yeah. for your social media managers out there. Josh, I seriously cannot thank you enough for coming on and hanging out with us would love to chat here in the future too down the road as we get some more blue beetle content as we get more yeah please wonderful works uh you you have a home here at the show uh for whatever that means to you for us it means thank you and uh we can't wait to see what else you have coming down the pipe yeah thank you so much for having me guys i'll be back anytime of course well folks check out washington's gay general the Legend and Loves of Bon Baron von Steuben, excuse me. And then, of course, Blue Beetle Graduation Day. And then the upcoming run of Blue Beetle. And then, of course, check out the movie as well. It's it's going to be a great movie. I know people want to complain about superhero fatigue. But at the end of the day, this is going to be a fun movie. It's, mm -hmm. it's about heart. It's got family. And uh, you know me. I'm all about that family aspect. Oh, here we go. I knew it was coming <laughs> back to Fast and the Furious. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you know what I'm in the bag for. So check all of these things out. Stay tuned. Check out Josh on social media. Check out all of our stuff at Hops Geek News. And we will see you guys next week when Lauren might survive from her 40th birthday. I don't know. She's getting up there now. So we'll see. I know. It, Ooh, I'm still survives. in my 30s this week. And, uh, Happy birthday. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see if I survive my move across the country. More to come. It's like an episode of Dragon Ball Z. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>